Um, I did an eight week course uh, starting in January through March. And uh, they were about two hours each. We had a bunch of people sign up for that. It was just a working out thing I did with advertising. And this was, uh, uh, this is an encore of one of those days I did. And uh, so this was the one where I just wanted to talk about, kind of relax their brain a little bit because you guys know this is pretty complicated. And it was still just a one-on-one -on -one kind of class. But even one-on-one, -on -one, you know, for two hours, I get in and they're all like, whoa. <laughs> you know, like, this is complex stuff. So this one was a, a sort of a relaxing one. The, the funny cultural and history and beginnings of, of Bitcoin. And anybody around um, before like 2014 that's, that's here today? 2000, when, what's the earliest year that you guys kind of discovered this? Anybody in 2014? It was going down, down, down. I heard about it. You know, yeah, research. I watched some, watch some news in the pound cost collapse. Yeah. I yeah. bought it in 2014. You bought, what was the cheapest price you found? 250. 250? Yeah. Nice. Anybody lower, lower? Anybody under 500? 500? Good, nice. Anybody under 1,000? Say Bitcoin price. Anybody in Ethereum right now? Nobody yet? What was the cheapest Ethereum that you found? Six dollars. Six dollars. You could buy it at six. Oh, even just last November it did for a minute. Yeah. Six range, right? 165. 165? You got it around 10 bucks. Yeah. I bought it at 350. What's the highest? Yeah, what's the highest in the now? <laughs> Anybody right at the top? Hey, I don't want to brag, but I buy it. Oh, my God. I'll throw a Yeah, you did sell some? Yeah. I did too, a little bit. I thought, all right, I'll sell just a smidge and get off all my notes, except my notes. So I'm just, it's amazing we can sell just, just a little bit and you're pretty much out of debt. Yeah, it's nice to be early. And there's a lot of ICOs. Anybody? Invest and throw some money in some of these ICOs that have come out recently. Any good ones? Anyone that you know that really has taken off? Uh, I just invested in uh, what's it called? Um, was it YouTube token? Uh, music uh, uh, co founded. Co founded? Oh, yeah. That's that's that, too. that was just starting to get hot. So, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any good ones that you really uh, did well on already? Patientory. <laughs> Patientory, right? Yeah, we both got into that one at three cents. And now it's fourteen cents, right? But yeah. that's just barely started our market, so we'll see how that goes. Healthcare, uh, universal healthcare token or something. That could be good. It didn't go one and two cents. It's like fifty-five cents now, so yeah, a lot of them kind of pay off. So let's get, let's get into this. Bitcoin's first wacky years. This is kind of the rundown. Genesis block, we're going to talk about Hal Finney. $25 million pizza, legendary, right? Bitcoin bursts. The history of hacks and scams. The confused press reaction, heroes to zeros. No such thing as bad publicity. The surprising twist of the Silk Road. And Bitcoin obituaries and honey badger. Anybody know what the honey badger is already? The honey badger, one, right? The Genesis block. Times, January 3rd, 2009, Chancellor on the brink of the second bailout for banks. Does this mean anybody, anything to anybody? This quote here? You know what that's from? This was the first message in Bitcoin. It happened the day Bitcoin went live. So, January 3rd, 2009, just after the New Year celebration, Satoshi Nakamoto, almost nobody knew who he was at the time. So, you know, if you do a, a kidnap, whatever, and you have the hostage hold the newspaper up so they can see that they're still alive on that certain day, he wanted to permanently stamp in the code the day, the newspaper article for the day it came out. So there was no doubt about the day that it, uh, it couldn't have come out before that day. The Bitcoin network was quietly activated with no fanfare. There was no press. Nobody noticed. In fact, it took five days for the first block to be found on his laptop or whatever he had going, his first machine, because nobody knew where it was. There's a bunch of misfits, little cyberpunks, most of them, you know, a handful of them, most of them didn't think it was going to work. There was only one, I think, at the time, Hal Finney, we'll talk about him, that says, you know, this thing might have a chance. 
you know, this is an interesting experiment. This is Hal Finney right here. A lot of people wonder if Hal was Satoshi Nakamoto himself. He always denied it, but you can go back to the, uh, since nobody knew who Satoshi, Satoshi was, they only talked, spoke to him through email and messaging. And so there, are, and it's all recorded on, if you go to Bitcoin Talk, you can see they're recorded frozen in history, all the conversations that happened in those very first moments and days and months. And there were some, as I read those, some of them were from Hal to a Satoshi, so it would seem where he would be emailing himself. But if I'm trying to keep myself hidden and anonymous, maybe I might do that. So some fun facts about Hal Finney, he was an interesting guy. I'm going to move this microphone here so I can kind of see the top. Some people call him Satoshi, number two. He mined Bitcoin with his laptop. He gave up when it began to get too hot. His wife complained about it. But the value was zero at the time. He got several, several thousands of these things because there was no competition for it. And he stored those Bitcoins on a CD-ROM that he put in a safe, so it would write on them, whatever, so nobody it was offline air gap, so to speak. He denied being the real Satoshi, but although he found himself at the center of the action, and of the action, uh, at a later date through an amazing coincidence. And I'll talk about it since I don't have another slide for it, but uh, they thought they discovered the real identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. There's a big Newsweek article, and they found this guy called uh, Do what's his name? Dorian, Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto, right? It's a little older Japanese guy in California. And as they reported on this on the news, you know, people all over the world, like this has been one of the biggest man hunt mysteries in modern day. So the cars all over for people all over the world chasing this guy down in his in his little house, you know, when he was taking care of his grandma, his guy's like, he's retired. But he's like, don't, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And it turns out he was only a couple of blocks from Alfin where he lived. So amazing coincidence of anybody in the world who many people thought was Satoshi, you know, Satoshi uh, was a, had a false lead that was you know, just a few blocks away. Strange. Hal died in 2014 from Lou Gehrig's disease. But interestingly enough, he took uh, Bitcoin off his CD-ROM to pay for his medical expenses. They were, they were quite high as he tried to save his life. He went paralyzed slowly, he would do interviews. And on Bitcoin Talk, if you're interested, he, he posted a, a message when you could pretty much not even talk anymore about what's called Satoshi and me. So he talks about you know those first few days. Very, very interesting. He received the first Bitcoin test transactions with Satoshi himself. He was the only person that ever got money from Bitcoin from Satoshi. Satoshi Nakamoto uh, mined pretty much by himself in the first year, his baby. This network that was, uh, you know, good for the problem of all people to just take over, trying to fly under the radar. People suppose, and do the tracking of the mining, whatever, and, and suppose that Satoshi could mine about a million dollar, a million Bitcoin. For himself, as there was nobody else. So, and it's never moved since then. That transaction to was the only transaction that was ever um, officially sent by Satoshi. And then, as a test, and there was an email back and forth recording that and, and you know, the results of all that. Uh, how when Hal died, very interesting, he was a futurist. He had his head frozen, cryogenically frozen, hoping that, you know, they find some body, <laughs> you know, so they want to have a cure for this. And he'll wake up and be in the future or whatever. So, that really works enough, but, but uh, Al believed in him. Interesting guy. Bitcoin history. You guys know about the expensive pizza that was bought? This is the first transaction ever conducted that gave Bitcoin an actual real world price. In October 2009, Bitcoin, the exchange was estimated actually the people that were mining it, just a bunch of cyber geeks, um, it had zero value. So they sat on the, on the boards talking to each other and says, we had to just give Bitcoin a price. What would you think it is? And they figure, well, it's costing us money to run these mines. It's getting more expensive after a year. You know, these, it gets more difficult. More people would get on the try and uh, win the prize to be able to transact in it. And so one guy thought, okay, how much electricity now is this taken for us to do it? And so they calculated for an hour or whatever of electricity, it would be uh, one thousand three hundred to a dollar. So micro micro pennies. 
was the first official, well, and it wasn't the official because no one ever bought anything with it. In May 2010, the first real world purchase was those Papa John pizzas in Florida for the trade of 10,000 bitcoins. It wasn't Papa John's themselves that took it, there was like, you know, two crypto geeks around the world, one in England and one in Florida, says, hey, I'll order you a pizza from your local pizza place if you send me 10,000 bitcoins for it. Okay, we did it. So that actually set the price at about a quarter of a penny. But the crypto geeks thought this is amazing. Someone actually paid someone Bitcoin for something. And the price went from a quarter of a penny to eight cents in a week or two. So I don't know what the math is on that, but it was pretty high, you know, 2,000% or whatever. And so that went a little crazy. Eight cents, this thing's got value one, right? I can't believe this. So the crypto geeks, the cyberpunks that were buying this for a year thought, you know, hey, man, if you could get a dollar, meet parity with the US dollar, we would be crazy rich. You know, we might have 10,000, maybe we have $10,000 in Bitcoin. So every 10, US government officials pressured all the US payment process to stop sending payments for WikiLeaks. Julian Assange was there. Uh, running the scene, they called Visa and they called MasterCard and says, Look, you need to stop or we're going to start giving you a lot of problems. There was no due process. They just said, uh, We're going to audit you and we're going to make your life miserable if you continue to let Visa transactions go to fund this guy. So people in Bitcoin says, Hey, they're radicals, right? right? Anyway, they're uh, libertarian, anti government people, anyway. To, to them, that was a, a moment of freedom, of rebellion, and they said, Let's send Bitcoin to this guy. It's got a little bit of value, what, 10? By then, it was like up to a quarter. And they said, we can all send Bitcoin to him as long as somebody accepts it on the other side. And Satoshi Osori says, no, do not kick over that horn's nest. We want to fly under the radar but as much as we can. That, the government, we're too small. They will stomp us. When Bitcoin network works is you need to have a consensus of processing power. 51% of the network has to be honest miners. And they can withstand the tax up to 49% and still maintain control of the network. But as soon as, as soon as somebody has more processing power and owns 51% of the network, they get to dictate what actually happens in there. They can take over the network. And at that time in 2010, they were fairly small. It would take not a lot of, you know, a government with the, the, the processing power it would have to stomp on it pretty easily. So we had said stop, and then and so he didn't, he did not send it. February 2011, the Bitcoin price reaches parity with the US dollar. Their dreams come true. All kinds of Bitcoin miners sold their Bitcoin for a dollar. A dollar. Little did they know. March 2011, the biggest Bitcoin exchange for quote unquote real money was Mt. Gox. Most people, I refer to it as empty Gox because they were empty pretty fast. <laughs> Uh, that stands for Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, in case you didn't know. They were built to trade playing cards for, this, for that little game. And uh, Bitcoin were, you know, 15, 25 cents, whatever. And they thought, we could make this a game token. Why not? You know, people could use this to buy the cards and the games and whatever. They were building this tiny little website to be able to handle that kind of traffic, not knowing the rust was about to hit them as it went to dollars and then $10 and whatnot. And what not. And of course, when it comes to real money and they weren't protected, didn't have any kind of security team, it was a one guy operation pretty much. But they handled 80, 90% of all Bitcoin transactions, pretty, mostly because there wasn't anybody else. April 2011, the mainstream starts to understand what this is. And uh, Time Magazine in 2013 actually named the hidden Satoshi Nakamoto as Man of the Year. By December 2011, Satoshi made his final post. He indicates he's done with the project and he has moved on to other projects. And that was the last of it. That was about the time that, that he was had been turning it over, getting less and less involved, and had another team. And we'll talk about those getting more and more involved. And it kind of dribbled a little less, a little less, a little less. And then it got to this point where he says, uh, he's done. And uh, it might have been coincidental because the guy, the main guy who took charge of it was Gavin Anderson. And uh, the CIA had requested a special meeting with Gavin, wanted to come visit them. And uh, that wasn't more popular with a, with a group that doesn't trust the government, especially the cryptographers, the uh, cyberpunks, they were anti NSA and CIA. So it was about that time that he went silent. That was the last post he ever made.
which I find interesting because that's about the time how we were really starting to get sick <laughs> and unable to do much and uh, was going downhill pretty fast. I don't know if that means anything, but I thought that was a kind of an interesting coincidence. Or Bitcoin first. First purchase after pizza. Uh, the, the guy that was in charge actually kind of went around trying to promote Bitcoin. So he went to some of his neighbors. It happened to be a guy that uh, built or had a farm with that alpacas, and he they built they they that was their little farm business, and they made alpaca socks. So that was actually the first thing on a catalog that they actually offered as a business that says, "Hey, we'll take Bitcoin for this." So that's now the legend: Grass Hill and Alpaca. We have some people in Salt Lake, actually very famous. Anybody know Mike Caldwell and the, the Casesis coins? You heard of those, right? So these are now collector items. He would put a uh, Bitcoin, actually the, the private key under a hologram, put on these little tokens, were really car wash tokens. They, but he would have a hologram that we'd put under, you'd have to peel off with a one way, you know, they way you couldn't put it back, but he would have the private key to be able to spend that on this hologram. But that was popular because people couldn't imagine this digital only currency. You need something physical, something that your brain can wrap around. So he created these things uh, to give somebody something tangible that they could use and they could actually spend as well. So they would peel it off and, and then they'd have the code they could, you know, transact in that. And some people, you know, got around the world on these events because most people didn't still didn't know years later there was a, a, a couple, in fact, one of the guys that's part of the Bitcoin meetup period, they were here in Salt Lake that found a way to travel around the world using nothing but Bitcoins. And a lot of them use these physical Bitcoins to be able to do it, like paying gas or whatever. They'd go introduce themselves, have to introduce what Bitcoin was, and say, hey, we got one for you. And these actually have a value. And while they're traveling the world, I think the price went from like 50 to 250 bucks. So it probably got a little easier. But according to them, they were making a movie about it, the documentary. And there were some hungry nights as they got to parts of the world. And uh, some lonely nights where the hotel wouldn't be necessarily take them. So it was sort of a rough experience, but they found airlines that would take them, you know, a little here and a little there, kind of hopped around. They ate it. And I think they said they were going to do it in 30 days. And I think they, I think they did it around that. So there's a documentary on that, My Life on Bitcoin. I don't know where you find it. I wish the guy was here to tell us, but he's not. The physical Bitcoin was Casasis. I actually own one just because I knew this was going to be a collector item one day. In fact, James now owns one too. There's an inner Bitcoin meetup where there was a guy, a neighbor of mine that was here, right? And he sold you a half of Bitcoin after a lot of wrangling and you had to talk him into it. And what was it, a thousand bucks for half one? And I remember he walked out with a beam. I got a collector item, half Bitcoin for a thousand bucks. Now you look at it, it's like, what, 2,500? Like, <laughs> score. Collector item and, and it's it's worth more than that. So he scored on both fronts. That was that was a good call. Good good salesmanship. <laughs> you can sell a lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> you start going up in value because yeah. that, it's really oh, unique. Exactly. So I, I looked this up on Bitcoin. This is a closed transaction that actually sold for eight thousand five hundred dollars for uh, one that was in two thousand eleven. It was still loaded. So they are worth a lot of money. And if you could find the very first batch he did, he built an eleventh. He created eleven thousand of them. He put the hologram in his garage, and uh, they have an arrow in this bill because he says wrong. So if you can find one of the rare of the first eleven thousand, they are tens of thousands of dollars right now. And I would imagine those are going to go nothing but dunk too. So I wish I saw one for sale for three thousand dollars back in two thousand thirteen. Oh man, I wish I would have done that. <laughs> I debated three thousand bucks is you know, quite a bit of money, so I. That had to take out a loan or whatever for it at that point. But uh, looking back, but he had to quit the US government not understanding Bitcoin says, You are minting money. You are not allowed to do that. And so they raided his garage <laughs> thinking, You are minting money. He says, All I'm doing is putting a piece of paper that anybody can have on a sticker and putting it on the car wash. Actually, he had approved it by then. He was actually putting out actual silver and making it a little more fancy as people are beating down the doors to get these things. And so he sold several hundred thousand before the before the government come and shut him down. And silly. I mean, he says, well, what if people print their own, they buy their own Bitcoin wherever, and then bring it to me, and I'll tape it <laughs> to a car wash token for him. They still have a, bit, a little bit of problem. He kind of just gave up and said, oh, by then I'm sure he was pretty rich because in a garage full of tokens that had gone from you know, a dollar or two, to, by the time he stopped, they'd been a thousand. So he probably retired in comfort. 
but we do have uh, some neighbors of his come to Bitcoin meetup often. So uh, I've been trying to talk him into the meeting, let him be vile, some, or, or talk him into sort of kind of friends into making me a couple just as a just a friendship thing. I uh, haven't been able to do that yet. Can you imagine how rare that would be like on a 2017 because it's just one? Yeah. So this was full, Bitcoin was full of, of hacks and scams and people just accidentally losing their Bitcoin. Mostly it wasn't worth anything. So um, they, there was actually a, a, a website that you could go to the people that owned them or mined them back then that lost them. And they're trying to account for how many were lost. And it's over a million Bitcoins have been erased or lost or sent to, it was really easy that time to send to an address that didn't exist. They just, they were destroyed. And uh, I don't know if you guys may have heard it, but some of the legend, there was a guy who uh, had his hard drive at his desk and actually threw it away, or his wife threw it away, and he went to the landfill to try and find it. His Bitcoin went to five, five six, seven hundred dollars. And then, of course, the landfill was like, no, you can't be digging in there, but they spent, they had a team, an army of people that went digging in the trench area the, around that area because it was worth, at that time, 17 million bucks. They were just find it, though. But, that still shows up on the blockchain, right? So they, you don't know on a blockchain what's been spent, what's been lost, and is there an echo, a shadow of lost money that will go through time, never being spent. But that makes uh, that makes us all a little bit richer that own Bitcoin because that takes it out of the supply. No one's going to be able to buy those. So uh, all of us have just got a little bit richer because of that. So you got to thank them. The first one that lost it is uh, 2010. He lost nine thousand dollars of it because. Well, he didn't back up his wallet keys when he went into the hard drive went out. Bit4 2012 was hacked for $24,000. At the time, it was worth $250,000. Today, it's worth $60 million. Bitcoin saved as a trust was a Ponzi scheme. 2012, it was busted. At the time, they held 146,000 in Bitcoins. At the time, worth 800,000. Now, worth 365 million. I don't know what he, uh, what he did with those. I know he went to jail, but you know, you can hide money pretty easy in Bitcoin, so maybe he's a rich guy, maybe he's out of jail now. My Bitcoin was a scam wallet service. There was a lot of these. I just trimmed them, you know, I this one on 25 lines and I trimmed them down to make this go faster. Lost 79,000 at the time. They've been up quite a ways, 2.3 million now, $179 million. And of course, the most infamous, MT Gox. At the time, $400 million made deadlines everywhere. In today's money, $1.6 billion worth. Ouch. Uh, just for your reference, the rumors were they were empty six months, a year before they actually closed up. And the, uh, the withdrawals got slower and slower and slower. So people that were keeping track in the forums were saying, I think these guys are around on this. You know, I think they've been ripped off. They've been, they've been hacked three times. And each time the price, in fact, the worst one was in 2012, the price went from $30 all the way down to two dollars and it lost 90 percent of its value wired magazine declared it dead the life the birth and the death of bitcoin and then when it got to two dollars everybody wrote it off at that point but it's been called dead several times and it comes storming back let's move on to bitcoin shall we that's a, a virtual currency we're going to talk about the cyber threat now who's ever heard of the bitcoin it's going to be called the future of money the bitcoin more on this Somewhat confusing currency that is Bitcoin. In for fascinating ways, it makes new highs every day for me, Simon, which Bitcoin has done. Is it, is it a market? Is it a bank? Is it an exchange? We're asking whether or not this currency really has any longevity, let alone legitimacy. You would have to be an idiot not to know how much risk you're bearing if you purchase Bitcoin. The value of it, I mean, look at the chart, is is sinking and skyrocketing. If this is a commodity, it's no different than the tulip mania of the 1600s. Beds are starting to crash down. It's about virtual currencies. Wild web currency. It had a bad take on people said it was being used for narco trafficking, potentially uh, to that terrorism effort. Some rumors that it's Japanese guy, but I actually know that he's a fake name with a pseudonym. I mean, you're not only putting the real money on these. It is legitimate and it's a fascinating experiment. It's an interesting brain job, though. It really is for people who are not able to do it. I think the current is not so well that you've got to come to the money and busy yelling the dollar and money on the side. The current scandal is a couple of more than 40 percent of my bank in this country and around the world. But the banking crisis there does raise the intriguing question of what is money? What exactly is Bitcoin and 
how does it work? There is no central bank, no central authority, no a corporation behind it. There's no borders, there's no boundaries, and in many cases, there's no rules. It's a new internet protocol like email or the web. And all this is done on peer to peer networks. Nobody really even knows who created the Bitcoin. Develop a highly open platform. No one's in charge. Free totally market. Okay, Free so, market. so the value of the Bitcoin in a new high, it has, as this chart shows, been skyrocketing in value over the past three years. I know some people are obsessed with this and have been all over this quote unquote phenomenon. So many people are jumping into this virtual currency. It's creating so much attention. One of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges actually reported that it was having trouble technologically keeping up with all the order flow. It's unknown creators sending a finite number of the digital currency of 21 million with only 11 million in circulation. The maximum amount of Bitcoins that can ever exist on the planet is 21 million Bitcoins. Some would argue that it is more useful as a of money because it cannot be defaced by people like Ben Melanchthon or the drug dealer. There's no inflation because you don't run the risk that anyone printing the currency. Geek currency, Bitcoin, has been under fire recently for its dramatic price swing. Is it just going to keep on going up? Now, if you get a bite at the Bitcoin craze, you may have saved us hills of money. Mary Thompson is here. What was that with the flash crash? Everybody's been talking about it, and the hackers are actually to blame for this most recent sell off. Last night, the digital currency's major exchange, Mount Gox, as it's called, was hit with a denial of service attack. What do you make of this madness? Well, I think Bitcoin has turned into a massive multiplayer online game where speculators are trying to out speculate each other. Despite the extreme volatility, businesses are trying to catch in on this uh, phenomenon. A lot of venture capitalists are actually coming into the space. Some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, and even some big Wall Street names, two hedge funds, individual investors. All of the above. Private investors, private capital, venture capitalists are interested in this trend. Well, there are more and more places accepting it. It's just that you're very far from critical mass. The world's first ever Bitcoin ATM is coming to Silicon Valley. And you got, you got this. Uh, here in the middle of Manhattan, now suddenly taking it. Um, in various countries, that's really starting to uh, increase. In China, it's been pretty popular. In countries like Argentina, it's that's become uh, the capital of the currency. Many businesses are already accepting payments uh, with Bitcoins on Shopify.com, which has uh, thousands of uh, retailers just starting to accept the Bitcoin. Why is it Bitcoins? Why not? My mother's friend, of course, your son, when he thinks about Bitcoin, it's the same thing, it's got 50% as well. And there are a lot People who are fans of Bitcoin, but there are also regulators and officials who remain concerned. Multiple federal agencies touch Bitcoin in some sort of way, everything from the Treasury Department to the Federal Election Commission. Now it's certain, like if you can buy a drink with it, it's a real thing. I think that there's no way federal regulators will stand for this. The government shuts it down, what's it worth then? Oh, uh, bye. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. If the government wanted to shut it down, wanted to prevent it from, from uh, conducting a transaction, uh, they had no way to go. It's like cash. Uh, I, you can, you can want to regulate it all you want, but I'm a little, I'm a little worried that virtual currencies, whether it's Bitcoin or the next one that pops up, isn't something that, that from a practical uh, uh, sense you'll be able to. Is that stuff with the government claim an utter, total, and absolute monopoly of the means of exchange? Just last month, of course, the government shut down the Silk Road website and Amazon like marketplace for drugs, guns, other illicit goods. Gambling and other things. So if you wonder how long it matters, it's going to last. Value goes up. It sort of happens to be within the network. But if sentiment on Bitcoin starts to go down, you're probably going to watch that value from the status of the spirit. And I mean, the volatility of it has been outrageous. You know, it goes from 100 to 260. Yes. I'm walking with my new iPhone. I can dial up the, the dino, whatever it yes. is. And say, here's my, here's my Bitcoin. I mean, are you Kroger? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't know. Joe Weiss and Father Business and Science. I don't understand why you get it. I'm not understanding it. What do you think? I'm with it's you. Easy. I don't understand it. But the whole thing is done to the extent that the viewers uh, don't understand this. And by the way, I have to look it up to understand it. So if you've got a Bitcoin, you can sell me the Bitcoin. Well, it's confusing. It doesn't really fit in the normal regulatory categories. We, we hit it, Jeff. Uh, I'm just trying to get to grips with all this technology stuff. This latest surge came thanks to some high power support from within the US. Bitcoin arriving in Washington on the national stage. We've done the, the due diligence and say this is simply not a. a so, how did Congress get around it, though? 
I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think it's, I think we're saying, I think it's got a shot. That's what this hearing is all about. Today and tomorrow is the legitimacy, the rising legitimacy. Right. This is the tipping point uh, that you get. The Fed chair has made 10 years. Does it feel mainstream to you now? The Fed chair has come a very long way in a very short period of time. There's going to be some fallout. I don't think it has the potential to replace traditional type of policy. You arrive at a stage where something electronic uh, can affect the traditional market. What you're talking about right now is for the next three to five years, an unbelievably better score value. It is gold 2.0. So you think fine sauce is that when you find lots of regulation. That says something about it. Yeah, it's a good story that's associated with the reason which we go to the people have the 100 percent complete control of their own money. It's the first time in the entire history of the world in which something like that's existed. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is the first example. I believe they're going to change the world, but probably not in the way we expect. This is the time where people should be trying really big, crazy things. That guy at the end is uh, the owner of the Golden State Warriors, or one of the part owners, I suppose. And it was one of the main investors of Facebook. So he knows what he's talking about. And then I watched that entire interview. He's like, people are coming up with these dumb things, sort of like Snapchat or whatever, and got huge you know, valuations. And then there's something that could change the world like Bitcoin. And you know, people, of course, don't understand it. I don't blame them. It was weird. Come out of nowhere. You know, it wasn't built by known entities, built back by people who kind of shun the big entities. So appealed to me and appealed to the people who really think big. We have a cast of wacky characters that was in charge of Bitcoin and, and uh, involved with it sort of the beginning. Tell me, raise your hand if you know who these are before you can even say their name. So, anybody know this guy? Gavin Andres Anderson? He's the one who Satoshi uh, sent, uh, turned it over to. He, was, he had the, the lead keys. And there's really nobody in charge of Bitcoin, they say, but there's a core development team. There's a handful of people that have uh, keys to the, it's called GitHub. It's a place where they put all the open source code. And uh, there was only there's only a handful of people that have right access to it. There's a whole everybody in the world can read it. Everybody can submit suggestions to be reviewed that can be in, uh, merged into the code. But there are only a handful of people that actually have the keys to write to that code. Anybody know who this is? Hands up. A little bit less. You know who this is? Charlie. Charlie. Charlie Strand. Uh, he's probably the first person who went to jail for Bitcoin. He ran a little operation. Uh, Back east, he's like 22 years old, still with his mom and dad. But uh, he found out that people couldn't get money to Mount Gox fast enough. So he ran up that little financial exchange here in the United States that would be kind of a wheelbarrow. You know, there, he would have a bunch of uh, Bitcoin that he would always transfer from Mount Gox to himself and then resell it for a profit. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't have a license to do that. So, uh, plus, they found out that he was sending a lot of this money to people who was running a dark web, uh, Silk Road, a dark website that people bought sold drugs. And his excuse that he didn't know that was happening was a little bit flaky. So, he went to jail for a couple of years, kind of a white collar, you know, club med jail, but he, he was released recently. Anybody know this guy? Anybody? Anybody? This is Eric Voorhees. He, uh, the, in the first years of Bitcoin 2012, I think. He had created a gambling website called Satoshi Dice. And it was a very simple game. You just try to guess if a number was going to be higher or lower than whatever number. And you could bet Bitcoin on it. And it becomes so popular that people could bet Bitcoin. They were betting two, three, four, ten Bitcoins at a time on this stuff. It was just a random generator. And the, the higher or lower the number you would pick, maybe going one to a hundred, and you pick some really odd numbers, you'd get a really big payout. But it was fair. And at one point, that accounted for 95% of all the traffic on Bitcoin. It was really the only use case that people could find. Um, a few people bought and sold a little bit, but Satoshi Dice was the place to be. He sold it for 11 million Bitcoin back in 2013. It, was, it turned out to be around, uh, you know, you know, like 20, 30 million dollars. And today's money would be, you know, 400 million dollars. But he's an entrepreneur. He's a pretty smart guy. So anybody who's shape shift to buy and sell money. He started that. He runs the Shapeshift service. And he's got another one coming out, um, just coming out called Prism. Have you heard about Prism yet? That's going to be sort of a Shapeshift where you put a whole bunch of different cryptocurrencies in there and you can say, 
I want to kind of keep a balanced ratio, and so it will automatically rebalance your uh, like a mutual fund kind of thing will automatically rebalance and have as you see fit as the prices change up and down between two of them or three or four or ten. So Prism's a neat technology. Anybody know this guy? Infamous guy. This is the guy who ran the Silk Road, right? You remember his name? So grew Ross Holbright. So genius little kid, Boy Scout, you know, straight A student, super smart, super friendly, loved his family, in jail for the rest of his life. They uh, they busted him. He was in a library. He lived in San Francisco. Kind of gave himself away because he's before he started so pretty, he was kind of getting, using his real name and said, "Hey, we need some programmers for this thing I'm doing." And or not, he was using an identity, but then they could trace to his real name anyway. And uh, as they started zeroing in on him, you know, things were falling apart around him. We talked about him a little bit more. But uh, he was in a library, open library, with his laptop open as the SWAT team ran in. And uh, they saw you know, all the evidence on his laptop. So it was a pretty much open and shut case. But yeah, you know, because you could look at you know, all kinds of girls trying to go to his defense and free cross, big moments were coming up. And they were all showing up at the courthouse. And, um, you know, trying to get trying to get a big moment out of the country to, to you know get them off basically. This is Roger Holt, I should say. Anybody know this guy? Roger Burr. Okay. Yeah. So he's a, he's the one that started running the big campaigns. He put great big billboards up about Bitcoin and say you know about Bitcoin. Yeah. So he was one of the first people. He ran a, a computer memory place service that sold computer parts and he would he accept Bitcoin. And they called him the Bitcoin Jesus. Because uh, there was a lot of people who knew, knew about it, but he had a you know an entrepreneur spirit. So he'd go out giving people Bitcoin, just giving it to them, introduce them. Here's five, here's ten, whatever. Um, try this out. We've got this new technology coming to my website. You can actually spend these. I'll take it back. And uh, so they called him the Bitcoin Jesus because he gave all these things out. And now you know he gave away what would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Now. You may know this guy. Yeah, the infamous. MT Gox nerd. What's his name? Carpellis. Yeah. Um, think of the biggest nerd you can think of and then put that nerd on steroids. That's him. <laughs> and we'll talk about him a little bit more. Anyway, know this guy. This is my, one of my goofy heroes, Vitalik. He's the guy who start, started Ethereum. 19 year, old, 19 year old hacker started Ethereum. Um, went from playing with Excel when he was five years old, that was his favorite toy, to being, you know, with the awkward kid that didn't get invited to the high school dances and would go home and read, you know, do hacking. He admitted he was hacking and stuff. To now sitting before presidents and kings. And this guy, anybody know this guy? Yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto. Or at least he says, Craig Bright, I don't know, Australian. Who uh, came claimed the fame as uh, claiming he's the real Satoshi Nakamoto? The guy knows it all, quite a bit of stuff. The guy is a uh, professor. I watched some YouTube videos. He was teaching uh, cryptography and supercomputing to some people. And I found out later that was uh, because he went and gone to jail. And that was his community service. He didn't say that then. <laughs> but the guy, uh, the guy was smart. You know, I watched his classes. I don't know. Yeah, he had like a, a series of five or six of them. I don't know if you'd still find him on YouTube or not, but uh, interesting fellow. Probably not Satoshi. Early Bitcoin millionaires. What are they now? Well, Charlie's room, as I mentioned, went to jail for a couple of years. Uh, still a millionaire. Now he lives on one of those uh, tropical islands where they have flexible taxes. He was encouraged to uh, go to a place where they didn't have such restrictions as many as he, he started some new businesses. Who knows how, uh, how long it's there? Roger Burr, very interesting. He knows owns very many companies. He renounced his citizenship to the United States. They were not very kind to him. He spent some time in jail too for, uh, he says, sending firecrackers on, on uh, eBay. Um, they, I guess it's against the law to sell people with some kind of explosive device on eBay. So, uh, not very long, but he was mad. He hates the government, but uh, he was a token. One interesting thing is he was blackmailed a couple of years back. They said, uh, I'm going to give away all of your information, all of your secrets. I've broken into your email account, broken into all your bank statements. You left a password out there, whatever. And he immediately went to the hacking community and says, 
I will pay you Bitcoin to find this guy. And people are greedy hackers in the community. And the guy gave himself up that day. He says, never mind. Here's you. I will leave you alone. Uh, there must have been enough people who knew who he was to make you that there's no harm on thieves. Eric Voorhees, I talked about, he owns Shapeshift now, one of the most popular sites. He's a multi multi millionaire. One of the a creative genius, I think. A uh, young guy, very uh, skeptical of government himself. I mean, we see this. He's owned, uh, he started some companies in Switzerland and Panama. You know, not, but yet it's, the United States is not very friendly yet to uh, Bitcoin companies. They don't know how to treat them. Gavin took over the Bitcoin project, spoke to CIA, which made Satoshi not speak to him again. He led the project until 2015. He helped start the Bitcoin Foundation, the nonprofit group that educated the world about Bitcoin back when they were all confused. He saw all the, all the confused news reporters in 2013. They thought, well, why don't we create an atmosphere, a nonprofit? So somebody has someone to call. You know, we have a decentralized currency. We have, we have a few programmers that are sort of disorganized all over the world. They're not really, you know, a, a, a central place to be able to answer questions. They had no power over anything. They had no decision making. But at least they had a, a place that knew enough about it. They created this nonprofit foundation. So news reporters had somewhere to go get some accurate information. He made a probably colossal mistake when he went and spoke with Craig Wright and based on his conversation was convinced this was the real deal and uh, he got a lot of problems for that they found that he, the, the Craig Wright says I can prove who I am because I can one of these early transactions that you know were mine in the very early days the first day or week or whatever I can go sign a transaction from one of those accounts one of those addresses does anybody know what when you sign a, a transaction what that involves you can do it rather than actually sending money, you can send a signal out there. You can say, look here, I, I, I'm going to tell you the, the lazy dog ran over the fox or whatever, you know, I'll say. And then watch for it, you're going to come through, and then somebody which is knowing that address can watch the, the signature come through, whatever he said, and then he signed. So he was able to do that. He said, look at this, I can sign a transaction. And uh, right in front of Gavin, yeah, they had a brand new laptop that was bought from the store, you know, never opened before. They unwrapped it on the spot, just a random laptop. Uh, they used a blank USB key or whatever. Anyway, all the effort, and they had news reporters and everything there to witness it. And sure enough, Craig Wright was able to load a, you know, his Bitcoin wallet and sign a transaction. That's it, right? That's why it satisfied most people. And satisfied Gavin, except for the world of cryptography, cyberpunks are very skeptical of everything. And they really started to peer into this really carefully, you know, breaking it down scientifically. And they said, why of all the transactions in the world you could have picked, you picked the one that went to how many? The only one everybody has a public record of. And then they looked at it a little more carefully and they looked at the encryption that was involved and they and I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts, I don't even understand. But they said, look at the transaction, how it appeared, and the encryption, how it appeared on the blockchain. And they really broke it down. And they said, you know what? That transaction he did with Hal Fain was way back in 2009. And this transaction he just barely signed have different encryption techniques. And in fact, this wallet that was created, and this address was created, and used a, an encryption technology that was older than the one he just signed and should use the same encryption standard, nuts and bolts. But when he used it, it was 2013 technology. It didn't exist when the wallet was created and the address was created. So it he's backing stuff out where he was doing some funny encryption business and basically called him out on it. He uh, kind of, after this uh, big event, he kind of went and shot silence and says, oh, I, I really am, but I caused too much pain and I'm, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. So, right, yeah. And some interesting stories. He was working with a guy, um, also, he said he was a partner with a guy who wasn't himself, Satoshi, but th there was at least two of them. And the other guy died as well. The other guy was uh, paralyzed. He was working in Florida, paralyzed from the waist down. And he basically gave up on life, but he did a lot of coding too. He was a very uh, smart cryptographist, and they were really good friends. And it turns out um, they gave an award 
a Pulitzer Prize or, or, or a, a Nobel Prize. They, they, mock, they mock, honored Satoshi Nakamura. And they have the award, of course, they didn't show up for it. But the guy who was paralyzed dad was like 90 something years old. And you can go to the website, it's probably still there. And it says, um, I did, he just won an award. Can, my son, can you tell me what award he won? My son, he named his son. It was just in the comments of the board. No one ever answered him until after this all broke and they figured out you know, who was who on there. And so the, there was a lot of interesting pieces that gave a lot of mystery and some credence to the story here. And uh, the story was Craig went to his house and searched everywhere for a USB drive and talked to his parents. I don't know if he ever found a USB drive, but it might hold a million Bitcoin on it. <laughs> you know, if the story is true, um, you know, you start piecing things together that way. Like, hmm, maybe not such a you know, solid case either way. Be interesting to find out one day what's uh, what's what. Mark Carpellis. Now it got hacked. In 2011, it got hacked. Price drop 90%. I talked about that was the worst price drop. In 2013, they got hacked again. Price dropped 33%. And the one that shut it down in 2014, the price only dropped 65%. Relatively speaking, that wasn't bad. You can deal with that, right? Except, uh, that was all 2014. People outside were, uh, you know, picketing the, the place. He, I remember watching that interview. He's on one of those bouncing balls during the whole interview, just kind of bouncing through his little exercises. They ran home to be the, the reporter when they were done. It's like, why in the world is up with this nerd? But he wouldn't let him go back to the back office. The people you see there again, that's someone at the front desk, kind of the, the, the thing. But this was the now Cox worth, you know, four hundred million dollars plus, and he was the security team. He was the marketing team. He was the whole company by himself, and he was holding, you know, lots of secrets, as we now know, that was being hacked. And he was trying to catch up with new money coming in to pay for the people who were trying to pull out, and couldn't keep up. So the people were getting more delayed, more delayed, more delayed until it finally collapsed. And he loves cats, and so he went home with cats and hookers. I think is what the thing he spent his money on: kitty cats, bull cats, and hookers. Because really, he's a super nerd who's been in the market. Headlines that might have sank Bitcoin, but didn't. Chuck Schumer, anybody know who Chuck Schumer is? Senator Chuck Schumer? He's a guy who likes the limelight. He likes to throw uh, photo ops. He's kind of a weasel out of a uh, town back east New York or something. And he uh, calls a photo op and, and all these people show up to the, the press and says, look, we have this thing called the Silk Road. It's on this thing called the Dark Web and people are doing drugs. Your children are probably doing drugs and they're using this new evil currency called Bitcoin. And all these drug users around the world said, oh, Bitcoin? Never heard of that before. And so the price of Bitcoin skyrocketed a thousand percent overnight. As all kinds of people discovered, you guys know what the Barbara Streisand effect is? Barbara Streisand effect, she, she got mad at a photographer for filming and taking pictures of her home on, on the beach of California, big iceberg big home. And she sued the photographer for doing that, for, you know, invading her privacy like that. And of course, made all the news and all the people who didn't care about Barbara Streisand or her house, all of a sudden you got to see it was all over the news and it had the exact opposite effect. Of instead of nobody knowing, everybody in the world found out and knew about her house and where she lived and that she was being a weirdo about trying to keep it hidden. So uh, Chuck Schumer had did the, buy, the Barbara Streisand effect on Bitcoin. Later on, the Bitcoin and as a, the, the uh, Cyprus crisis and that happened in 2013 that had the price go from 60 to 260 bucks in a week. You know, they, they started uh, blocking people from withdrawing funds in the bank. Bitcoin went up 400% they saved so they could have protected themselves in some way. The FBI shuts down the online drug market, bro, and that was in the fall. Everybody thought that's the death of Bitcoin. That's the only use people had for Bitcoin was to do drugs. It was online dark web stuff. So with that only use case, it's got to be worth nothing. Yet within two days, it was 100% more when it continued to work and function and everybody thought, what? People use Bitcoin other than the not drugs. If we know what the most common use for Bitcoin is, not, it's not drugs. Anybody have a guess on them? They did a poll, they did a survey on it. The most common, at least in 2015, 2014, the most common use for Bitcoin was charity. They were giving it away. So, complete opposite of what the press is reporting. 
Senate hearing on Bitcoin was a love fest. I remember watching this live. They had the Senate hearings of people all over the world that had never watched Senate hearings before, had no good interest reason, but people all over the world thought this is a new thing. And they had the most televised audience that they ever had, and they brought, they brought that up in courts. And the judge, and they had people there from the FBI that broke Silk Road, and they had people there from the CIA. They had people that were uh, running the, the uh, exchanges. They had people there from Coinbase. They had Charlie Lee, the guy who wrote Litecoin, who invented Litecoin, was there. And it had the exact opposite of what everybody they thought. They said, they're going to shut this thing down. Well, how do you shut down Bitcoin? It's all over the world, and it's not centralized. Who are you point your guns at? But uh, as the people started to talk about this, there must have been really smart people whisper in their ears, indoors, behind the scenes, that said, you know what, this blockchain thing is going to be amazing. If you try and stop this now and stop it now, it would be like trying to stop it in 1992. All these inventions that happened after that would be left uninvented. And so we really highly recommend you don't touch anything right now and see what happens, see the innovation. So that was a turning point. If they had tried to stuff it, it wouldn't have really stopped it, but it would have you know, kept a lot of people away that would otherwise you know, be really interested in the technology. And so that was a pivotal moment in Bitcoin's history. But the press thought, oh, this is going to be the end. It's going to be, Bitcoin's going to drop to nothing. That week it went up 200% as the judges all showed just nothing but love for this thing. Even though the FBI was saying, I can't think of any good reason that anybody would use this or anything legitimate. Of course, that's their focus. I, all they do is look at bad guys all day. They can't see beyond the bad guys. But as the other people were there to defend it and show the world the possibilities that are just being peeked at, they said, we're going to let this go. Business Insider says that Bitcoin cost, cost $700 as those cement hearing wraps up. You know, they took a few days, and then you always see a little bit of delay. When I, whenever I see news, either good or bad, you can almost count on a two or three delay before the word spreads so you can make your bets right then, usually, and then they'll pay out about two, three days later. So uh, I made a lot of money in that week. Then China wants, why China wants to dominate Bitcoin? But about that month, China says, hey, we, we can open exchanges here. Bitcoin went up another 200%. You start adding those up together, it was over 1,000% in a matter of like two weeks. So my $100, each $100 went to 1,000. So my 60 Bitcoins went to 60,000. You know, in a week, so or I don't know if the math is enough, but it went up quite a bit. I was pretty happy for about a week, and that was the top, and then I was crying as it dropped. <laughs> that was a huge bubble. It had gone up, I think, 13,000% that year. I started buying at 30 bucks, so as it got to 1,000, I bought, I think, more at 850. Like, this thing's never going to stop. This is changing the world. And I think that was the highest I think I've ever bought Bitcoin. It was up to that point, 850 bucks, and then it went down to 200. So. Yeah, I never sold though. I thought, you know, if it's coming back, anything now it's coming back, and it did eventually. The Silk Road, we talked about this a little bit, we're going to go into more detail because this had a surprise, some surprising twists to it. Chuck Schumer brings all the attention to it. That's what the website used to look like. Mostly drugs, but I think they did some fake IDs. And they wouldn't allow something from like child porn. I don't think they allow guns on there either. Some probably do now. I don't know how to get on there, but uh, there's different replacements for it. Bitcoin, enemies like Schumer who beats friends. Yeah, exactly. And skyrocketed. Ross Obrey caught these from Texas. Like I said, he was actually reading about with a super nice guy. I mean, if he hadn't been doing the dark web stuff <laughs> and eventually tried to have a guy assassinated, another Utah tie, he was trying to have a guy assassinated that lived here in Utah. That was actually working with the FBI. You guys ever see Breaking Bad? I love to see that show. I love that show. Right. In one of the episodes, they had a guy um, fake a death, so they're trying to get a ring off another of his friends or whatever. And so they laid down the guy and, and put some hammer they just bought from the store right next to his head and some ketchup. Made him look like he was dead, just had his head blown off or whatever. And they, they staged it. It's like that. That's what they did in, in, this, in the case here, too. They, they showed Ross a, a picture of a dead guy he wanted dead that was working for him, faked to death, you know, hammer or whatever. And he said, okay, no, that's it, whatever. And, and so they, they caught him as part of that, as that, part of that trick. At that point, the FBI seized from the Silk Road 170,000 Bitcoin. They were worth around, you know, as they started to calculate it, you know, a thousand bucks of the pot. They, they were, at one point, the U.S. government was the largest holder of Bitcoin. 
And everybody thought, well, they're just going to confiscate that. They were never going to see that again. Nope. They auctioned them off. They realized this is a hurt trade. This is just another online currency thing. So most people don't realize not only did they squash it, they sold it back. They made a nice profit on it. And they did it in tranches. They were actually really careful not to disrupt the market. They were so nice to us that they did it. They had it auctioned. They didn't just send it right to market. They did it over four different tranches over several months. They actually held Bitcoin. And so all the people are saying, the government's not good of it. The government's going to stomp it out. The FBI themselves held Bitcoin. So they recognized the powerful usefulness of it. And they realized. They can track everything that happens. With cash, they can't track anything. Now, with the blockchain, they have an immutable record in five years from now. You can't, you know, you can't sweep that up very well. And uh, all they take, you know, they already have ways to get posting notes or you know, word documents that store passwords and have some kind of indication that will take it to the trail. And then they use that trail to, like a pearl of strings, find out all the, all the other bad guys that they do business with. They call it crime futures. They love to buy crime futures. It was the biggest Bitcoin wallet owned by the government we talked about. Feds auctioned off those Bitcoins. But did you know the people, the two main people that broke the Silk Road, was a, a DEA agent, was stealing Bitcoins. He was a corrupt official. And his partner from the Secret Service, we had one of the DEA and one from the Secret Service, both were stealing Bitcoin and trying to funnel through Mt. Gox and get paid off. They found both of them correct. They both went to jail. So people always hear about the Silk Road, but people busted to hear about Ross being arrested and how evil all this stuff is. Bitcoin actually led to the tracking of the two corrupt agents that were held in great honor before then, and they went to federal prison after that point. And it was because of Bitcoin. And if you're interested, there's a TED Talk that talks about this. It was a federal agent in San Francisco that busted. Awesome talk where she talks about how they used, this is the trail that they used from Ross to the guy in Utah. And the, and the secret uh, anonymous names that they were using as both the D agent and the secret service agent were using fake names and actually had two or three names and they didn't even know about each other. It wasn't like a team operation. They had no idea about each other as well. And so they followed the blockchain. They followed all the tracks. And made it fast. I hope they make a movie out of that too. The whole Silk Road, how they bust him, and then how the federal agents that bust him get busted, all because of Bitcoin and the blockchain. Bitcoin obituaries. Everybody, anybody look at the site? How many times has it been killed? Bitcoin's been declared by the press dead now, as of last time, 136 times. They had called it. They said, no, this is the end of Bitcoin. Dating back to 2011 when I started first hearing about this is ridiculous. This is stupid. This could never work. It dropped from $30 to two, the birth and death of Bitcoin. And they're still saying that this, this had an obituary yesterday. The scaling problem, the bottleneck, it's dead. It can't get past it. Long live Ethereum or whatever. You know, they think, you know, it's some, like the financial times. There are some people that have an agenda to talk about how ridiculous and dumb and stupid this is, even though they see. It's not going away. It was fairly posted about last night. This was last night. They, they post it. People update it every day, practically, as a new, another news article comes out. And so they keep a tally, and they show you what, what data was and how much the price of Bitcoin was that day. So the first one, like in 2011 or 2012 or whatever, Bitcoin was 50 cents or a dollar. They said, oh, this can't work. It's dead. And then the next time was a couple months later. I said, oh, this can't even show you the press release. They even have a link to it. But ironically, they have a price next to it. And each time it's death happens, it goes higher and higher. Now it's 100. It's got to die. Now it's 150. It's, it's dead now. No one's going to use it like $200. Interesting that even now, with all the evidence, economists hate it. You know, they, they think this, this could never work. Money has to be given by a government and has to be able to be printed, unlimited, to be able to handle the ups and downs of the economy. So they can't even get it through their head that this could ever be possible because it breaks every rule that they learned in economics class. And here we have the hunter, honey badger money. You ever see the YouTube video about the honey badger? Don't mess with honey badger, right? Very famous YouTube video. I don't have it on here, but they swear about every other word in it. 
and it's funny. And they talk about they showed honey badger and how they'll, they'll just go in there to a complete hornet's nest. Don't even care. They'll go take cobras, no problem. They, they're the Guinness World Record um, because they evaluate all animals. This was the toughest, meanest animal of everything they ever evaluated. And they're actually very smart, a bunch of guys who owns a little ranch or whatever and tries to keep them penned in. Um, these things are a couple out smart as far as climbing things and problem solving and figuring things out, and they are fearless. They don't, it's, oh man, I think I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's kind of the, the ongoing thing. And uh, as every time the Bitcoin gets called dead, that's the thing that's the honey badger of mine. Bitcoin don't give a shit. It's just going to go, you can't stop it. Can't kill it. It's just going to come back, usually stronger than ever. And Bitcoin Magazine, the magazine I wrote for throughout 2014. Actually, just a little trivia. I have my issue, my cover issue that I wrote. I had the headlining uh, article of that one, so they made it a cover issue that, that year or that month. Um, now it's featured in the Smithsonian Institute. So they have a past, present, and future section on money, and they chose to use my magazine. My cover issue was talking about Mount Mount Gox and all the different exchanges. So they they have that on display with the Cassius coin and some other things um, on the on display there. So if you go, hey, I'm like, and Vitalik was the creator, co-creator of the magazine, and also the lead writer of it, and he went on to start. Ethereum. He started the magazine at age 18. He started Ethereum at age 19. He knows five languages. I mean, he's brilliant. They, they say he's, his IQ is on par with uh, Einstein. And now Ethereum is the next big, big thing. And I love this shirt. All I care about is Bitcoin. Like maybe three people. So, uh, who is it? Did you find that shirt? I think you posted it. So we have a, we run a, a, a little website that we started, uh, blockchainlead.com, and we're doing some online, we're creating some online materials, of courses to take people right through uh, the on-ramp. So most people that we talk to, I don't even know how to get started on this stuff. 